might resume or start up being the creative human you started off being before they started grading you on it. I was told at a very early age I couldn't draw at all. I really was by a teacher that I loved, and I can't, but it still really hurt my feelings, <laughs> and I still draw stick figures. But a lot of you know when you were young, you loved to write, you loved to sing and dance and paint, and you were writing songs at a really early age and performing them, and then you stopped because you went to college or you, may, you had a family or you had um, a career and, and all of a sudden life got very lifey and you had big grown-up stuff to deal with and there really wasn't time for play and creation. But we don't consider it play. We consider it about reclaiming the original blessings that God gave you of having beautiful imaginations and, and maybe most important of all, curiosity. And so we're going to start with, uh, I'm going to just give you an overview of, um, of why we both feel so passionately that this is something you might want to consider starting or picking up again. Neil is very fierce about people finishing things. Um, he has two books out, so he has finished them. One is, was a, a lot about his life in, in the Diamond Heart School, and the new one, which is out in four days, four days, if he seems a little tense. Um, um, I can't think of what it's called. Better Days. Better Days, Tame Your Inner Critic. And I, we'll be talking about the inner critic a lot because that's the main roadblock to reclaiming the... the um, experience of writing, writing music and painting canvases, painting tiny, whatever. So um, you may be saying to yourself, I would love to do that at some point. I would really definitely like to start painting again. You were either really good or you loved it or both when you were young. And you're saying, but I have little kids or I'm taking care of my old folks, or both, or I'm just jammed at work. And both of us just think that is a total crock. <laughs> <laughs> and then the inner critic that Neil will be talking about, and if you want to know a lot more about it, his book is back there. Um, the voice inside you, you're, no one... Your family is not going to be happy to hear you're writing a memoir, okay? <laughs> Believe me. And other internalized voices are going to make it clear that you agreed you weren't going to tell the truth. You said when you were five, you signed a contract that what, what's happened in the house stayed in the house. If you were the child of alcoholics or the mentally ill, you agreed by three or four not to even see what was going on because it made everybody so sad and angry. In our house, we didn't. You got sent to your to your room without eating if you said anything about what you saw that was really scaring you. And writing can give you back a confidence in your own narration that what you see, what you're experiencing here, what you make of it all, is absolutely the truest scripture you can get down on paper. Um, I've always said that people wanted you to write more warmly about them. You, they should have behaved better. <laughs> and everything that happened to you belongs to you. And at another time, we'll talk about slander and libel. But everything <laughs> in you wants to keep you quiet. Because when you start telling the truth, it's messy and it's uncomfortable. Well, I've never met a man, and this was one reason we fell in love, who was so comfortable with mess and with staying in mess and with letting, with letting mess be the path and letting mess be the chair on which we sit and breathe and come through. So um, I don't think you should worry about how people are going to respond to, your, to whatever you write or paint. I'm just going to talk about writing, but what I mean is writing, painting, singing, dancing. Um, you just get it down. You just do it. To, you know, like the Nike ad said, you just do it. Everything in you 
is going to say, no, God, we don't have time. No, that isn't the way it happened. No, that's going to hurt them. And we think you should write anyway. Um, and the main thing you will say is that you don't have the time. And as I said, that's a crock. You, ha you only have the time. You only have the time to do the kind of work you're here studying and to create and to be. Uh, when my best friend of many, many, many years was dying, we went shopping. Uh, at the very end of her life, um, she died at 37 of breast cancer. And the, about a month before she died, we went to Macy's. I was dating a really awful man. I hope he's not here tonight. Um, <laughs> Uh, with issues you can't even guess at, but um, for another day. And she had a wig on, she was in a wheelchair, and, and I was trying to find a cute, tight little dress, because usually I sort of dress like John Goodman. You know, I wear baggy clothes, but I, I, I got this cute little dress, and, um, and I came out to where Pammy was sitting in her wheelchair, and I said, do you think this makes me look big in the hips? And she said, with no smile, she said, Annie, you don't have that kind of time. And that's the most important thing I've ever heard. And you don't have that kind of time either. Um, it's now is the time you have, and now alone. Um, we believe, both of us, that writing can give you a sense of reverence, of a really simple cloth coat reverence and curiosity, which is the same thing, and a new way of practicing just being here now. Neil talks about how singing is like the, a great um, meditation because you can't get to the next note. Um, you can't, wait, what is it? You, <laughs> wait a second. Presence because you can't either listen for the next note or sing the next note until this note is done. Until this note, so this note right the now. The easiest way to force myself into presence is to consciously put on music or to sing because I have to stay in the note I'm in. There's no other place to be. So presence and reverence. I mean, I think that's why we're here. Presence, reverence, love. Maybe they're all the same thing. So think of presence as being awe and openness to the world like little kids are, like the wee yogis are, you know? It's so touching. Think of the times when you've read prose or a friend handed you a poem. And when, when some of us who are a tiny bit less young than we used to be, when we were coming up and in our teens and 20s, people mimeographed poems that you absolutely had to read. It might be Mae Sarton or Allen Ginsberg or, or Yeats or, you know, and people go, oh, you've got to read this. And it would be how it would smell purple. It would smell like alcohol because they would have run it off a mimeograph roll. And it was sacred to you. And you passed it on. You crumpled it up. You put it in your back pocket and pass it on. But think of those times when you, had a, when you read something and you had a fleeting sense of being startled by beauty or insight. You know, sometimes one of the Doss brothers will say something or sing something and I will feel like I'm sitting next to a gong because I will reverberate with that moment's beauty and, and beingness, its very own beingness. And, and this is our goal as writers, to create those moments that are true and clear and honest that we share and give people that moment of, oh my God, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I never heard anyone say it before, or I, I have the exact same thing, but I not, but the biographical detail is different, you know. And that those moments that pierce through the very toxic busyness, the very toxic thinking that we know what's going on and what's going to happen next, and how it should all turn out, so that everybody can be straightened out and much less annoying, right? <laughs> So it, writing can give you back your sense of wonder. It can give you back your sense of, when, I, when we were kids, I'm a year older, but um, when we were kids, there was a sh uh, show on, there weren't very many shows, there were like eight shows on TV in the 50s and 60s, but one of them was called Car 54, Where Are You? Right, all the gray hairs are nodding. 
And, um, and there was a, char- a character on it named Officer Muldoon, and he was like this sort of goof- goofy guy. And, he was, and the other man would present stuff to him, and he'd always go, ooh, ooh, with total startled excitement because the lights had been thrown on for him, right? And when you're reading something, I know a lot of you were saved, like people are saved by Jesus or Buddha by the written word by chapter books, which are still what saved me one day at a time every night when I get in bed, by poetry and by the sacred texts. And you can have this experience of writing too because like Henry James said, a writer is someone on whom nothing is lost. And so you start to keep notes. You have pens, you have bits of paper. A lot of you young people are going to say, oh, I use my phone to take notes, and I'm going to just look back at you grimly and, um, and say, what if you tried paper? But, you know, we say in 12-step recovery, if you want what we have, do what we do. And I say as a writer, if you want what we've always had as writers, do what we've always done. Take notes, scribble. This is a sacred sound, the sound of pen or especially graphite pencil, which has only been around several hundred words years, but there's been papyrus. It's a sacred sound. And you're gonna start if you do it, you're gonna start having that feeling of Muldoon of going, ooh, ooh, I just realized what that color is. I just described, I just remembered, I just realized, I just visualized, I just figured out how to describe that color. I just just figured out how to get from that one passage of my work to the next one. It's called a transition. And it was, I didn't have a clue, and now I have it. And you get it down. When you were children, maybe this isn't true of the younger people here as parents, but when we were kids, the parents and the teachers were always saying, if it's important, you'll remember it. You know, and it was not true then. I didn't remember it then. I was just like I am now. I was extremely spaced out. I lost everything, and I was just tripping. I was trying to figure out what is life? How do we live? What are other people? Why would somebody do that? What are other, you know? And I was, um, and I'm like that now. And if, and I have to tell you that menopause did not heighten my sense of acuity and focus. <laughs> And that was 20 years ago, right? And I write it down. And you can ask Neil. It's never convenient. I um, Last night, listening to one of the Das brothers, Krishna Das, um, performing, I had like three ideas for a talk I'm doing tomorrow, and I didn't have paper and pencil with me, and I didn't want to take out my phone because my only hope is that he loved me and think I'm a person of value and not on the phone, like, seeing if there's spoilers for The Golden Bachelor tonight, you know? (laughs) And it plagued me because I wanted to remember it. Three things. Carry pencil and paper with you. I almost always do. But anyway, we think you can get back that sense that I had listening to KD of going, oh, I just got it. I just realized what the ending is. I just realized how to start, you know? And so anyway, but that feeling is so precious. Like when you read it, you buy something back there and you get in bed with it tonight and you read the first page and you go, oh my God, oh my God, because someone threw the lights on for you. And when you start writing and you write the truth as you can, you tell us a story and you make us care and you're writing towards empathy. You're writing to the real, not your fantasies. Not You're writing to you to, about who you authentically are and not who you agreed to be because it made everybody so much com- more comfortable if you would just be more like this. Like when I was a child, the battle cry at our house was, I was very, very sensitive. It was like, oh, for Christ's sake, Annie, now what? Because... I might cry. We had National Geographic around, and I'd see the cover, and I'd see children in India with flies on their eyes, and I'd see children in Biafra who were all bone and eye. And I would cry, because that's how we were designed to be. 
And what they said was, oh, for Christ's sake, now what? And writing can give you back who you were born and designed to be. And that is a beautiful path. Um, there is ecstasy in paying attention. And if you're going to be a writer, you need to pay attention. You need to pay attention to the world as it wafts and tromps by because you're taking notes. It's so fun. It's like being a kid again. It's like being a third, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like being a third grader, almost a fourth grader, because third grade you have the lined paper where you write your story, and then below you draw your picture. But fourth grade, you don't draw the picture, and so you have to take notes, and you have to connect one sentence to another, and it's kind of scary, and it's kind of fun. And writing is just like that for me. My 20th book is out next year on my 70th birthday. And, and, and it was scary and it was fun. It was scary and fun. And I wrote with what all writers write with, which is a combination of raging ego and narcissism and excitement about getting it down on paper and terrible self-esteem. And I just did it. I just did it afraid. And that will be true if you get into it. You'll be afraid, your stomach will clench up, your parents will be reading it over your shoulder no matter how long they've been dead. And you just, <laughs> you just do it. So um, anyway, I want to get to Neil, but uh, reverence, and empathy, which writing will give you for your characters, even your weirdest aunt that you're writing about, writing about her and her history and her challenges will give you empathy for her. It all amounts to giving us hope. It's writing for me that has been a, a writing girl and a reading girl since I was very small, four years old. It gave me hope that there's a path, that there are other people that are telling the truth, that aren't stifling at all. And hope, and bringing people hope, and bringing people the glasses of water of hope and truth is why we're here. We're hope givers, as people have been hope givers for us when we've been at our absolutely most defeated. People have brought us glimmers that things will be better. They brought us glimmers that there will be meaning, maybe not yet. And Emily Dickinson had this great line. And, and writing will give you that, I promise. Emily Dickinson said, Dickinson said, hope inspires the good to reveal itself. And in these dark, weird times, to be a person who is helping to reveal goodness, Oh, is so needed. Oh, is so needed. So if you tell your stories the best you can with truth and clear eyes, Neil and I both, he doesn't mind me saying this, we both some, write drafts where we write really a little bit more highfalutin than we mean to. We both know fancy words, especially Neil, who is overeducated. Um, <laughs> And we will both use words or ways that, and, and we'll catch, you know, we hand each other, we go, can, do you have a minute, can you read this for me? He'll say, well, I, you know, I don't know. And I'll say for him, do you have a, 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 a dime-sized word for that? The quarter-sized word stops me in my tracks because I try to remember if I know what it means. I'm a dropout. <laughs> um, but um, I forgot what I was going to say. It doesn't matter. Um, If you're writing with simplicity and you're telling the truth, it can be writing fiction, but we still have to believe that it's the truth. Uh, John Gardner wrote a beautiful, the late, great John Gardner, the motorcyclist, wrote a, a novel, a book on writing. What is it called? Is it called On Writing? Uh, we can, well, moral fiction. Is it called Moral Fiction? Anyway, he has a line in it I love. He said, writing is about creating a dream, and the dream must be vivid and continuous. And what it means is that you can't use quarter-sized words, 
because a lot of us won't know them and it will make us feel stupid. And then we're not going to read your book anymore because now we hate you because you've made us feel bad. That's my thinking. Um, there is a door that we all want to walk through. Every person here knows what I'm talking about. There is the door. There is the door to freedom and to now, to being, to being love, to being bread for the journey, a door of meaning, a door of breath and spaciousness and the joy of connection to each other and to the divine and even to our, our own sometimes disappointing and glorious selves. And that's the door and writing can give you that. So I just want to read you the last paragraph of my, a book I wrote on writing which is called Bird by Bird. Um, writing and reading decrease our sense of isolation they deepen and widen and expand our sense of life. That's the door we want to walk through. We want to walk through, we want to walk away from the busyness and the to-do list and the obsession with what we meant to say and, and what we're going to say if we, if, if we and, as, and as soon as, and oh, what I, we want to walk to spaciousness. We want to walk into the expansion that breath meditation offers and that writing offers. Writing and reading deepen and widen and expand our sense of life, and they therefore feed the soul. When writers make us shake our heads with the exactness of their prose and their truths, and they even make us laugh about ourselves or our life, our buoyancy is restored. Laughter is carbonated holiness. You want to get, you want to get holy? Tell somebody what... What, what you never told anyone, and you'll start to laugh about what you just read that you want to share. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought that, oh my God, I have? And you start to laugh, and that is carbonated holiness. Um, we are given a shot at dancing with, or at least clapping along with, the absurdities and awfulness of life instead of being squashed by it over and over again. It's like singing on a boat during a terrible storm at sea. You can't stop the raging storm, but singing can change the hearts and spirits of the people who are together on that ship, as the 400 of us are this week. Now, there's one tiny problem, and I'm, I'm done. <laughs> one tiny, tiny problem, hardly worth mentioning, and that's our minds. <laughs> Because the minds like to get involved. And the minds mean that it, the minds are the ping pong game between our narcissism and our really, really damaged sense of self. The raging ego. And especially the voice that keeps you small and scared. And that is what Neil does with his clients. That's what he will do with you here this week. That's what he's going to do for us now. If you want to find out more, it's in better days. But we are all in the same boat. God is my witness. We are all in the same boat. So this is Neil Allen, my personal husband. But I digress. <laughs> it's not in my little script. Um, I became a writer for an odd reason. When I was a child, I couldn't finish stories. I would start to tell my friends or my parents or my brothers or anybody a story. And I'm talking about from four or five yeah. through 16 years old. I could not finish a story. I would get tangled up. I couldn't 
put the pieces out there in a logical order and end up with a conclusion. And so I was the kid who runs on and on about the TV show and seems to never get to the end, except that I actually literally never got to the end. And I just discovered that if I wrote things down, it planted the components, the puzzle pieces, before I got to the solution, and I could write the solution in a way that I couldn't speak the solution. Um, by the time I was 16, I was a very quiet kid. Um, I had friends, and we goofed around, and I could socialize and do all of those sorts of things. But I didn't trust my voice unless it was on paper. Uh, I hadn't thought about that, and I'm, I've actually never talked about that before. But that's actually why I became a writer. Um, also, I mean, I, I came from a household with books, and so that made a big difference too. Um, I'm also gonna, I'm gonna tell another story that I've never told before. Um, it was uh, the early 70s. I had returned to campus from summer vacation, campus in New Mexico, and we're all trading stories about our summers, and my friend Eric Bateson won. He told stories about the summer he spent in Boulder. And Eric was um, the stepson of Gregory Bateson. And Gregory Bateson, some of you will remember, was a great um, anthropologist and linguist and just general all-around thinker and probably the primary forerunner of um, family systems therapy, uh, among other great things that he did. <clears throat> but Eric's stories weren't about big ideas or thinking. They were about uh, Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso and Ram Dass and a lot of you here were there during those summers, or some of you were. Um, Jack was there and people who aren't here today were there, but um, Sharon and other people. And I heard about these people and I heard about these events. I, I particularly remember a story about this guy, he kept, Eric kept talking about this guy called Rinpoche. And I thought that was the guy's name, you know, like Jesus or Madonna or, um, and so I, I for years, uh, would remember vaguely the stories about Rinpoche, about Rinpoche sitting, or Rinpoche being carried across the Naropa campus on Gregory Corso's shoulders, right, smoking a cigarette. Um, and that was my touch point to the Ramdas community for 40 years. That was my only touch point with this community, was vaguely remembering Eric Bateson's stories about a summer he had spent in Naropa. And about 15 years ago, I accidentally started to embark on spiritual adventures, and various things happened and brought me here. Um, Rinpoche was actually a guy named, who a lot of you have read or some of you have met, a um, guy named Chogyam Trungpa. <clears throat> and as it turns out, as things happen, uh, it's now 50 years since I first heard about him. And with 35 of those years having absolutely no reason to think about him, and the epigraph to my book is actually from uh, his masterpiece, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. And I'll read it. According to the Buddhist tradition, the spiritual path is the process of cutting through our confusion, of uncovering the awakened state of mind. When the awakened state of mind is crowded in by ego and its and its attendant paranoia. Uh. It takes on the character of an underlying instinct. So it is not a matter of building up the awakened state of mind, but rather of burning out the confusions which obstruct it. So that's what I write about. It's also 
um, what my uh, private practice is about. Um, burning through the obstructions. And for me, burning through the obstructions is the same thing as interviewing, investigating, and uh, generally exploring uh, the thing that most people call their inner critic, um, that Freud labeled the superego, and that probably most, if not all of you, uh, experience daily. And I'm going to start first with a simple question. Well, two simple questions. One is, who here has an inner critic? Okay. And the second question, who here believes it's part of them? Most people think it is them, that you're having a dialogue with yourself, that there's a side of yourself that's deep down inside that has a particular narration and a particular voice to that narration, and that it's basically offering you instructions and advice to yourself and that you're talking to yourself. And I'm going to try today in 10 minutes to disabuse you of that notion and to get you to at least start, if you haven't already, some of you have, I know, but if you haven't already, to start looking at it as a parasite and as an unnecessary parasite, as a rather idiotic, bullying, stupid parasite. So to do this, I need a volunteer. There's Jamie. Annie asked me whether I was going to do, use a shill for this, and so I'm going to ask Annie to pick a volunteer. Jamie. Oh, wait, are you Jamie? Yeah. Jamie, do you want to do it with him? Sure. Come up here. No. Um, I think 